So I'm going to try and give, um, uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, a, a, a rapid overview of what I think are some of the key challenges uh, and also hopefully some, some ideas of solutions, but the challenges um, facing malaria at the moment. Um, I was sort of struck by listening to Peter talking about HIV, about sort of the time scale that we're talking on here with, with the HIV sort of emerging as a public health um, crisis sort of 40, 50 years ago, and now we're going to this massive decline already. And if you think about malaria, we've been with this for centuries. And for much of that time, we have been completely neglecting it. And it's only really, I mean, there's been, there's been periods of activity in, 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 in the 50s particular, but it's only really been in, in this uh, century that we've really started throwing the resources needed at this. So I want to talk very briefly about the changing pattern of malaria transmission. This dichotomy, or if you like, or this conflict, I, I, I think it is becoming a conflict between control or elimination. Um, um, and then talk about what we've got in our toolbox at the moment, what's coming on, along the line, and then, as I said, uh, focus on four of what I perceive to be of the key challenges and, and how we might address those. Malaria um, is still uh, causing um, many, many cases every year. The current estimates are 216 million cases each year, uh, 445,000 deaths from malaria. If you look at the burden, the burden is predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa. And I must now apologise to colleagues here from Asia that most of what I talk about today is going to focus on falciparum malaria in Africa. And I haven't really addressed the issue of Vivax, which is because it's quite different and there wasn't really time to address that. But, but also because the, the key burden, 90% of malaria, is in Africa. And why is that? These are all diseases of poverty, so the lowest resource countries have the highest burdens of these diseases. But I also want to remind everybody it's a vector-borne disease. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. There are Anopheles mosquitoes all around the globe. We have several species here in the UK, but they're not all the same, and they don't all have the same behaviours. And it's the propensity of the mosquitoes, the Anopheles mosquitoes found in Africa, to feed on human blood that makes malaria transmission so efficient in Africa. So this is a figure showing the proportion of blood meals taken on humans with different Anopheles mosquitoes from around the world. So you can see in Africa, Anopheles gambi, Anopheles finestus, the major vectors there, really like humans. Uh, and therefore transmission is more efficient. So how are we doing in terms of malaria control? Well, this is a figure from a paper published a couple of years ago, which received a huge amount of attention, a good, good news story. This is estimating that the burden of malaria has halved since 2000. So this map on the left is malaria prevalence in the year 2000. This is in 2015. So, um, but it's important to think a little bit about how this data was obtained. This is a modelling study. It's very, very difficult to get accurate data on numbers of malaria cases. Most malaria is asymptomatic in the adult population, so we really don't, don't know. But this is the best estimates that we could obtain at that time and showing that scale up of current interventions had had a dramatic impact in halving malaria over 15 years or so. But the reality as some of you may, may have observed yourselves, in some settings can be quite different. Most of my field work at the moment is in Burkina Faso, so I'm just using this as one example. Um, this is the numbers of severe cases of malaria in Burkina Faso over four different years across the different weeks. And really it just shows no, no change really, you know, fluctuating, but, but, but no really impact. And this is despite two rounds of mass distributions of insecticide treated nets, very effective distributions during this time period. And recently the latest version of the World Malaria Report issued by WHO last year estimate that malaria cases are actually increasing. We have 216 million cases in 2016, 211 million estimated in 2015. So huge margins of errors around those estimates, but it's plateaued, I guess, at the very least, and it may already, it may be increasing. And as I said, I wanted to touch really on the issue of, of elimination. Buoyed by the success that we saw in the early part of this century, there was a call initially by um, Melinda Gates and then adopted by WHO and the, and the global malaria community a call for elimination of malaria as a public health problem. And this is one of these optimistic maps produced. This is from uh, UCSF showing you know, shrinking this malaria burden. This is what it looked like in, in 1900. This is kind of where, where we are now. And this is a projected until 2040 in a world free of malaria. Many people who are working in, uh, at the front line of um, malaria control and working in high burden countries know that 
we're just overwhelmed with malaria cases in many of these countries. If you look at where the burden of malaria is, 80% um, of malaria cases um, occur in just 15 countries, <laughs> all, all but one of which in, in Africa. So Nigeria and, and DRC and Mozambique, incredibly high burdens. And to think that we're going to go to this situation in that number of years, I think is hugely optimistic. Now, why does it matter? It's good to be aspirational. But it, I think there is an issue here because the type of interventions and the type of research you need to get to elimination is quite different to what you need to control. And, and I think that's it's a, it's a very interesting... And, and if you, when it was first um, suggested that we could eliminate malaria, there was a lot of debate about what do you do first? Do you go to the high burden countries and try and reduce it? Or do you go to the easy targets and, and as this is shrinking the malaria map? This looks good when you shrink the malaria map, but does it have the maximum public health impact? Well, that's debatable. So what do we have now? Um, we have this toolbox of interventions to prevent malaria. Vector control by bed nets predominantly, indoor residual spraying, rapid diagnosis and treatment. Treatment in pregnancy, malaria and pregnancy is a big issue, but WHO strategy for intermittent prevention, preventative treatment in pregnancy. And more recently, seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis is treating older children in a population to try and reduce the circulating um, burden of, of parasites. And underpinning all of this, and in fact as an intervention in its own, in in countries as the burden of malaria is reduced is surveillance. So surveillance as an intervention because if you go from the situation where pretty much everybody in the region has malaria to where you may have hotspots, knowing where those hotspots are and targeting those is, is an important intervention. So I guess the first of the key challenges is we've got these tools, they work really well, malaria is a preventable disease, why are we still seeing 200 uh, million cases every year? And so of course access to those key interventions is critical. So this is a figure, and David referred to it earlier, that this is taken from that paper looking at the change in malaria burden over time, and this is now looking at how these different interventions contributed to that reduction in malaria cases. So of the 663 million malaria cases that were averted since 2000, is estimated that 80% are due to vector control. So 68% from bed nets and another 11% from indoor residual spraying. And then active case detection and treatment also contributing here. So, so we've got tools, they do work. Why aren't we getting malaria down? Well, of course, it's issues like finances, equity, capacity, um, inefficiencies in the system. I and mean, there's a big challenge about getting these tools to the people that need them most. And of course, how do we address this? It's well recognised we need more funding for this, but I think there are also some more nuanced approaches. And when we look at the funding, clearly demonstrating value for money is very important. And I think one of the tricks we're missing here is looking at integration of malaria control and the control of other vector-borne diseases. So these tools like bed nets and IRS, uh, uh, well, IRS in particular, is protecting against many uh, um, vector-borne diseases because transmission of many of these diseases occurs in the home. So there's an, an issue about what happens if you draw IRS for those diseases, but also saying we can achieve much more. We are already achieving much more. We're getting huge value for money from vector control, but we're not illustrating it well. And there's a massive capacity gap. We, we need greater capacity to scale up these interventions, to improve surveillance, but also, as I'll, I'll come to in a minute, I think we're We've done the easy bit, and now we need more tailored solutions for local context, and that requires local capacity to understand the best interventions to, in the local setting. That brings me on to my next key challenge, and this is what's often referred to as residual transmission. So this is just a figure showing here, if it's like a hypothetical scenario, you've got high levels of transmission, you implement your current WHO recommended interventions perfectly, and you reduce this very big impact, but you still get some persistent transmission. So even if we could implement our tools perfectly, we wouldn't achieve the goals of malaria elimination and would only have a limited impact on control in some high burden settings. And so again, this is from the same study, and so I have a lot of information on here, but I just want to highlight the point here. This is looking at the transmission indices. So this is the number of infectious bites every, every year a person gets. So when you've got places where you've got very, very high levels of transmission, 100 or more infectious bites. If you want to reduce malaria, so this is looking at a number of new cases that emerge from each malaria case. You can get down from very, very high levels to you know, levels of about 10 or so bites per year by implementing these tools. But if you want to get down here to like one case a year and even to elimination, we need more tools. These current tools are not going to do the job. So what could these tools be? One of the big challenges is outdoor transmission of malaria. So our bed nets have worked so well in Africa because most of the 
transmission occurs inside the home at night, but not all of it does. So once bed nets reduce that type of transmission, what about the people either are not using nets or are getting bitten before using nets or for various reasons that are not being protected by nets? So there's some promise here in some, some new tools that are showing promise in early trials. But I think one of the challenges here is going to be nets are so simple to, to implement, but here something like an attractive sugar bait might work very well in a sort of desert setting where the, there's not many other sources of sugar so the mosquitoes will be attracted to this but in a rainforest area it's probably not going to be so good and your vectors are going to behave differently so we need more local knowledge. And I think another really promising results from some of these mass drug treatment trials, mass drug administration or seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis have shown some really good results in, in certain settings. Problems here with adherence, rebound, drug resistance, and they're not appropriate in all settings, but some encouraging data from these trials. The third challenge, um, resistance. So uh, resistance to insecticides and resistance to drugs. This is a map here showing malaria vector populations across Africa and the red flags are those that that are resistant to pyrethroid insecticides, which are the only class of insecticide that we have to treat bed nets. So pyrethroid resistance is pretty much everywhere. There's a lot of debate about the impact that this resistance is having, but I think where there is consensus is something that we need to be worried about because it's growing every year. And at some point, those nets will stop providing the protection that we are reliant on. And of course, there's this big concern about the emergence of artemisinin resistance in the Mekong region as well. So what is being done about these? They're product development part partnerships and, and DFID are big supporters of these that are sort of stoking a pipeline for new insecticides and, and new drugs. So this is IVCC, the Innovative Vector Control Consortium, that's working with agricultural companies to develop new insecticides for malaria control. Number of promising products, but it's a long-term game. We're a long way, really. Some of them have been implemented, but these are, are really sort of adjustments to existing insecticides, not the new insecticides we need to combat resistance. But there is a, a healthy pipeline, and same with drugs, very healthy pipeline line of new drugs coming through at different stages of the pipeline with, with some recent new drugs introduced as part of this Medicines for Malaria venture. But these are quite long term and I just wanted to give just one example of something that I think uh, where we can understand a bit more gains to be achieved in the shorter term and that's by just again remembering that this disease is transmitted by mosquitoes and if we know a little bit more about the, how they behave and how they transmit with the things that we could do more rapidly. This is somebody sleeping under a net and each of these coloured lines is um, from a mosquito coming into the room, filmed in darkness, and it's showing how they approach somebody under the net. So the mosquitoes all come to the top of the net, they're attracted by the odours, and they come from the top. We put insecticide all over this net, but actually all the insecticide contact is at the top. So what Philip McCall's group have been looking at in, in Liverpool is a net with a barrier on the top. So when they come in and they swoop and they do this and then they touch this, maybe you only need to treat this with insecticide. Or maybe you have pyrethroid insecticide over the net, but this has a new insecticide that might be more expensive or perhaps slower acting or some other property that wouldn't make it ideal for the whole net. And some early trials in Burkina Faso, this looks very promising. So this would be a quick win. We wouldn't have to wait for a new insecticide. Slightly more complicated bed net design, but not insurmountable. So brings me to my fourth challenge, um, which is the rate of introduction of new tools. This has to be sped up. So this is the timeline for the introduction of one of the arguably the most successful public health interventions, insecticide treated nets. First trials were in the 1980s, about five or so large scale trials, which were then synthesized into a review. And then another five years passed and then WHO made a recommendation that it should be used for at risk populations and then eventually universal coverage. And we've seen since, since these recommendations came in, massive, massive scale up of use of these nets. But 20 years since the first evidence came out. And what really concerns me is that I think we're about to repeat the same problem again with recent guidelines that have just come out from WHO. There are now new bed nets on the market. They have been actually for 10 years, but they haven't been deployed because there's no WHO policy on where they should be used. We saw the pipeline from IVCC of new insecticides. Some of them are coming close to being available, but now we have got guidance from WHO that says new product classes, such as new bed nets with new insecticides, we had to provide evidence of public health value, and that's very sensible. We all want to know that these new products work because they're going to be more expensive, and so of course we want rigorous evaluation. But this is going to add five years and, well, a very conservative estimate, five million dollars to the time from which these products are ready and before countries can deploy them. 
and we need to get this happening in, in parallel with the development somehow and not wait till the products are ready and then start evaluating them. And I think this is a really, really big challenge, particularly as pyrethroid resistance does undermine the efficacy of our, our current tools. Finally, just about thoughts about addressing this challenge. Well, I think that what we do need to do with some of these new tools is have a phased implementation with evaluation. There's a big push for full randomised controlled trials for these. But as I say, they take a long time and only only impact on a small amount of people, I think we need to get some of these tools out quicker. And of course we do need to do better. One of the key issues is that the countries are waiting for this evidence at global level and yet they're generating their own data at national level and trying to strengthen the uptake of national data in forming policy for controlling these diseases is one of the key objectives of the projects that just started with, which is about increasing the impact of vector control by integration between research and policy, but also by integrating between multiple vector-borne diseases in country. So I'll finish then with just uh, some conclusions. I think we've seen that our current interventions have been extremely successful. Um, cases have been reduced as these interventions have been scaled up. But the next phase is going to be much harder. Many estimates say that we, you can really, we've done what we can. You can reduce malaria by about half in high burden countries by bed nets and uh, improved diagnosis and treatment. But getting that down to lower levels is going to be much, much harder. And we've got the threat of resistance that might undermine that, that progress. So we've got good progress in development of new tools but we need to do more about accelerating the access to these. We need better partnership and more equitable partnerships to, to ensure that we can set appropriate strategies in country. And I think that we're going to risk reversing these changes so we don't speed up the rate in which we get these new interventions um, out to the people that need them.